Okay, in this lecture we will solve a, uh, a very familiar uh, partial differential equation. This is the heat equation. Uh, we will use the method of separation of variables, which works for homogeneous partial differential equations with homogeneous boundary conditions. And we're going to use a uh, Dirichlet type boundary condition at one end, that is at the end x equals zero, and at the other end we'll use a Robin boundary condition. And we're going to assume that this parameter h is a positive uh, parameter that will come up later in the in the lecture uh, and uh, our initial conditions will be just given in terms of this generic uh, f of x so u of x 0 equals f of x is the initial condition that we'll use and uh, so in the method of separation of variables what we're going to do is to uh, guess uh, a solution that can be written in the in the form of a function of t multiplied by a function of x and uh, so I'll call this big x and big t and uh, what we're going to do is to uh, substitute this guess into our partial differential equation. Uh, and our partial differential equation, remember, involves a, uh, a partial derivative with respect to time on the left, a partial derivative with two partial derivatives with respect to, uh, to x on the right. And, um, and so after uh, taking those two partial derivatives, we have this. Uh, notice the time variable gets differentiated. The x variable does not. On the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, uh, the time variable does not get differentiated and the x, big X gets differentiated twice. Uh, so now what we're going to do is to divide by big X, big T, that is uh, by our assumption the, the solution to the problem. So we're sort of putting all of, all of this equation onto terms that are relative to the size of the solution, uh, the derivatives relative to the size. On the left hand side, we have uh, T prime over T. Uh, and that's only a function of time. And on the right hand side, we have x prime prime over x, uh, which is only a function of x. And so the only way that we can independently vary x on the right and not have, uh, and have this function changing, uh, but always equal to something over here that's a function of entirely different variables, is if the two sides of this equation are actually uh, always equal to a constant. And so that's the idea behind the introduction of this separation constant. Uh, is, is that we can actually separate the t and the x dependences and require uh, each of the two parts to be uh, constants. So now once we've got these things separated, I can extract from this two equations. Two equations. There are ordinary differential equations now. So we started with a partial differential equation and now we have two ordinary differential equations, one of which only involves the variable x and one of which only involves the variable t. Uh, so uh, what we typically begin by doing is to uh, find eigenvalues of the x equation because the x equation is the one that involves the self-adjoint operator. So this second derivative operator is self-adjoint. Uh, we've discussed that in previous lectures. And so uh, what we want to do now is to go through and, um, and find uh, admissible eigenvalues and eigenfunctions for this big x equation. Okay, so if we let lambda be zero, uh, the same thing that we've seen in the past is going to happen. This becomes big X prime prime equals zero, which integrates to give me a first order polynomial AX plus B. Uh, when, I, and it, when I put in my boundary conditions at X equals zero, uh, the AX term vanishes and that tells me uh, that in order to recover zero, I must have that B equals zero. Uh, at the other boundary, that is at X equals one, I have X prime of one plus H times X of one. Uh, that's going to reduce now that I know that b is 0 to a plus h times a, uh, which is just a times 1 plus h. Now remember that uh, h was a positive number, and so the only way that this can be equal to 0 is if I actually let a be equal to 0. So this resulted in a trivial solution, and uh, so therefore our eigenvalues uh, cannot be 0. Uh, if we now let, uh, we consider eigenvalues that, that might be positive, then we have lambda equals mu squared. Uh, this is a uh, equation with constant coefficients. Uh, we can solve that. It gives us a, a sum of uh, exponentials that are growing and, and shrinking. Uh, or we can write this in terms of cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic, uh, which is convenient for our case. So x uh, of 0 equals 0. Clearly sine hyperbolic of 0 is 0. So all that's left here is the cosine hyperbolic at zero, which is one. That says that the a, which is gonna be left over, has to be equal to zero to satisfy this boundary condition. So there's no cosine hyperbolic uh, in this, in this uh, component in this equation. So now we have uh, another boundary condition um, that involves our, uh, our uh, values at, uh, at x equals one. 
uh, when we plug that in, keeping only the sine hyperbolic term, so this one comes from big X prime, uh, evaluated at 1, and this one comes from big X, evaluated at 1, but then multiplied by H. Uh, so when, when I uh, take this and divide through by cosine hyperbolic, uh, and cancel off the factors of B, which are irrelevant in this case, uh, then what I recover is an equation for uh, the values of mu, uh, that would satisfy this boundary condition. And what you see here is that I get mu plus h times tangent hyperbolic of mu. So this is basically uh, telling me that, um, you know, on, on I can think of this graphically as uh, h times tangent hyper, this should be tangent hyperbolic. Let me try and fix that right now. Okay, there we go, tangent hyperbolic. Um, so tangent hyperbolic uh, of mu multiplied by h looks like this. It's sort of asymptotically going up to a uh, value of h. And on the other side, I've got minus mu uh, when I subtract this over. Uh, so, so these two things uh, intersect like this. The only place these are going to intersect for a positive value of h is at a h equals 0. And so again, we uh, find that uh, if I let h be equal to, or sorry, uh, if I let mu be equal to 0, then, then uh, clearly sine hyperbolic becomes 0. We recover a trivial solution only, um, and that's not, um, that's not an admissible eigenfunction. Okay, so now on to case uh, lambda less than zero. Uh, now here uh, you get the equation for simple harmonic motion. I have a sine uh, mu x plus b cosine mu x. Uh, putting in my boundary conditions, you guys have all, all seen this a few times now. Um, of course the uh, sine just becomes zero automatically. Uh, the cosine becomes one. And now that tells me that b is going to have to be equal to 0. Evaluating the other boundary condition now, keeping only the a sine of mu x term uh, when x equals 1, uh, gives me this equation that a mu cosine of mu plus h a sine of mu has to be equal to 0. Again, we're going to divide through by the cosine and get this into a form where we have one trigonometric function uh, set equal to uh, mu over h. So this is now uh, going to be a viable uh, solution, a viable equation that defines my, my eigenvalues. So, um, so why is that? Because the tangent function has many branches, right? So uh, we have a branch between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, uh, one between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, one between 3 pi over 2 and 5 pi over 2, etc. And uh, looking at the other part of this equation, the minus mu over h equation, you see that this is uh, just a line sloping downward. Uh, and so this is going to intersect at this point at this point, at this point, and these are all non-zero. They're all going to result in non-trivial functions that are, that are eigenfunctions of this differential operator. Uh, so uh, Stanley Farlow in his textbook has worked out the, the numerical values of these uh, mu1, mu2, mu3, etc. Uh, for the case h equals 1, and uh, what you see is that they're uh, increasing by approximately pi each time. Uh, n equals 1, you have 2.02. Uh, at n equals 2, you have um, uh, 4.91, and then 3 is, seven, is almost 8. Uh, okay, so, um, so what we found here are a set of eigenfunctions. They're solutions uh, to this uh, eigenvalue equation for the x variable. Uh, so we have x n of x are given by sine of mu n of x. So we don't have, in this case, uh, those nice convenient eigenfunctions that we got last time, where we had sine of n pi times x. These now have to be numerically determined. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they are eigenfunctions because they came from a self-adjoint operator with homogeneous boundary conditions imposed. They are going to have all the properties that the spectral theorem guarantees that they will have. That is to say, they are going to be orthogonal to each other, uh, and they are uh, going to have real eigenvalues associated with them. Uh, for each eigenfunction, we're going to have a, uh, a time constant, and therefore a different, uh, a different uh, time, ver time variable, big T, uh, part of our solution. So going back to that, we have uh, Tn prime of T is uh, minus lambda, or is lambda times Tn. And that lambda is now, we know, minus mu n squared. Uh, so this is the solution. It just describes an exponential decay uh, with rate, uh, with rate uh, mu n squared. Okay, so uh, now we know that every a uh, pair of these eigenfunctions and and uh, big time variable uh, is a solution of the partial differential equation. They just are solutions that describe different uh, different eigenmodes of of this uh, partial differential equation. And so now uh, we know that because all of the pairs are solutions, 
any linear combination of those pairs will also be a solution. That allows us to go back and uh, write down the full solution as a sum, as a linear combination of eigenfunctions multiplied by time-dependent coefficients, right? And, and if I plug in the zero time result here, what you find is that uh, I get on the left-hand side, uh, u of x and zero is my initial condition. On the right-hand side, this exponential term up here is gonna vanish when I plug in t equals zero, and we just have the tk of zero. Uh, so so if, I, if I remember back to the very beginning of the problem, we had an initial condition that said u of x and zero is some function of x. And in order to decompose this relationship now and find specific values for the tk of zero, we're gonna use orthogonality. Uh, so in order to find the tm of zero, we're gonna take the uh, inner product on the left with the mth eigenfunction. Uh, that looks like this. Uh, it's inner product between x sub m, big x sub m, and f of x. And uh, writing out f of x in terms of its equivalent Fourier series here, uh, we see that I have inner product of x of m uh, with this summation of an infinite number of terms. Uh, the only one of these terms that's going to contribute, though, because of orthogonality, is the one when k is equal to m. And uh, that's a result of our spectral theorem. Uh, so you have t sub m uh, is, is now, uh, if I multiply it by the square norm that comes out of this inner product, uh, we get an equation that we can solve for t sub m, and that is just that t sub m at the initial time uh, is my expansion coefficient effectively, and it's related to the inner product of f of x with, uh, with the mth eigenfunction divided by the squared norm of that nth eigenfunction. Okay, so this is what, uh, what we've done. The inner products notation is really uh, a bunch of integrals. You want to uh, make sure that you know how to do that. These are um, these are integrals over the over the domain of the problem. Here's the initial condition. There's the eigenfunction. Uh, in the case where we need to evaluate the squared norms, we just square the eigenfunction and integrate. And the solutions qualitatively look something like this, right? So um, this is uh, decaying uh, gradually uh, down towards uh, the equilibrium situation uh, when all of the temperatures are the same as this boundary. Uh, and that is is it for, for this example. So we have taken a, uh, a partial differential equation with homogeneous boundary conditions and solved it using separation of variables.